All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Vicki Johnson. I'm the founder and director at Profello. And I have a very special guest today for a video interview. Um, this is uh, Rachel Santrazero. And she uh, is someone that I met way back in 2019 when you were just a recent graduate uh, coming out of college. Uh, and you started working in civil engineering, which is what you did your, your first degree in. Uh, part of the reason we met is because uh, you were actually one of the very first students in my fully funded course and mentorship program for graduate school and fellowship applicants. And at that early period, you know, you were applying to fellowships, also thinking about graduate school. Um, and so because you are one of our success stories from the course, uh, now we are still working together and you're actually a coach in the fully funded course and mentorship program. So I just wanted to share your really interesting story uh, today since you've moved from engineering into the field of international affairs. So uh, Rachel, welcome. It's, it's yeah. great to have you here. Thanks so much for having me, Vicki. I'm really excited to chat and it's been it's been such a great journey. So I'm excited to kind of talk to you about it. Absolutely. We're going to break down uh, how you got to where you are now, which is actually two things. Uh, first, uh, I know that you're a fully funded master's student in uh, it's science and technology for innovation in global development. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, one. long title. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, where, where is actually where you did your uh, bachelor's degree. So you're currently a fully funded master's student there. Um, but you're also a Herbert Scoville Jr. Peace Fellow in Washington, D.C., which is a, a six to nine month uh, work placement in a policy think tank working in international peace and security in Washington, D.C. And I was really excited to hear that you had won this award because I was a Scoville Fellow myself many years ago back in 2005. So now we have even more in common. So um, I wanted to learn more about how you got there, the fellowship itself. And let me just mention um, what you're doing during your fellowship. You're a, a fellow based at the National Security Archive um, and doing work there. I'm going to I'm going to ask you a lot about, you know, what is your day to day fellowship like and also how you're incorporating that into your master's studies. This let's talk a little bit more about the Scoville Fellowship. So mm -hmm. even back a long time ago when I was applying, I knew that this was a really competitive fellowship. I mean, they only take about two to five fellows per cohort. They do two cohorts a year, but this program gets hundreds of applications um, and it's still being, uh, it's it's directed by Paul Repson, who's been there even when I was a fellow, which is amazing. Uh, and it's been such a joy to be part of this program that he's running. It's such a unique program. They place all of the fellows in uh, full-time work placements in these policy think tanks in Washington, D.C., and as well as government organizations and others. And uh, when I first saw the fellowship, I thought, wow, this is incredible because it's really hard to get your foot in the door into mm -hmm. even into unpaid internships in exactly. these organizations because they just get so many applications. So um, tell me a little bit about the Scoville Fellowship. Why did you apply for it? You're currently an enrolled graduate student. Uh, why did you apply? What did you hope to get out of it? And then um, tell us about the placement that you chose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just exactly what you said, having that proximity and that access to some of these, you know, policy think tanks or research organizations. That's something I knew I always wanted and felt like, you know, just like you said, it's really hard to access when you're kind of on the outside of it. And especially, again, kind of coming from more of a STEM background, I feel like I didn't have a good way to kind of enter this world without some kind of fellowship or research internship or something. So that ultimately was a big reason why I ended up applying and, you know, especially just getting the chance to be able to work on, you know, these cutting edge issues that are happening around us right now, like climate change or just, you know, other aspects of national security, peace building. I mean, the subject matter itself was so fascinating. And I knew, you know, if, if I could apply to this and be fortunate enough to get in, I think it would really give me the tools to be able to continue on and be a better problem solver and better work on these global issues. So I felt like it just, you know, really married well with the type of work that I was already doing in my fully funded master's. And now it just had, you know, this DC aspect to it that I was really looking for. Um, but yeah, like you said, I'm working with the National Security Archive, um, which has just been an amazing experience. They're a nonprofit research organization, library facility, publisher, you know, Mm -hmm. advocate for government transparency, and they work to provide, you know, journalists, librarians, scholars, researchers, 
with, you know, this trove of declassified and unclassified documents. So, you know, their biggest thing is really promoting government transparency through conducting a multiplicity of research projects and sending Freedom of Information Act requests to different government agencies. So I've really been fortunate that I've gained so many skills, um, especially, you know, these Freedom of Information Act or FOIA requests. Um, I think that's just such a valuable skill that I've been able to pick up that I definitely want to take into my career, whether it's in academia or journalism. Um, and so the two main projects that I'm working on are kind of related to my two biggest research interests. The first one is um, Middle East related. So we're looking at US Iraq policy during the war in Iraq. And then the second project is related to climate and security, which has just been so interesting and so timely. And you know, it's great kind of being able to delve in how these government organizations are thinking about these types of problems. Oh, absolutely. Um, and and what is it? What other benefits are there from the fellowship too? I mean, you've got this really interesting mm -hmm. work placement. Uh, what else are you getting out of the fellowship? Yeah. So, like you mentioned, we usually have you know either monthly or bi-monthly meetings with policymakers. Um, we it's up to the cohort to kind of see who is interesting to them, and we get to kind of pick who we want to talk to and what type of work we're interested in. And the fellowship, you know, really gives you that proximity and access to be able to talk about people in the field. Sometimes, you know, newer people in the field that are just getting started, and then sometimes more seasoned people who have, you know, seen so many different types of peace building and national security issues. So I think just really having that access to so many different types of work that people are doing down here, you know, academics, people in Department of State, people at USAID, people at nonprofits, it's just, you know, such a great exposure to the type of work that, you know, we could do down here. And then I think also, you know, just the cohort that we have, I think, you know, it's kind of across year to year, these cohorts are just amazing people from, you know, all over all different perspectives. And I think it's really kind of just opened my mind to the types of possibilities that are out there. I do remember that I, I really enjoyed the cohort aspect of it, and mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like the the program's doing even more than than even when I was a fellow so many years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's incredible. Just celebrated mm -hmm. the 35th anniversary of the program. Mm -hmm. it launched a new website, so there's a lot of exciting things going on with the fellowship. Um, I want to ask you as well. Um, some people are doing uh, the fellowship as as sort of their only, you know, like their paid job. Mm -hmm. You're doing it uh, as an add-on experience to your graduate studies. Um, right. Tell us. How is this adding to your graduate school experience and even potentially maybe your, you know, future career mm -hmm. uh, goals? No, absolutely. I think, you know, like you said, I think a lot of, you know, Scoville fellows choose to kind of do it after their undergrad experience to kind of segue them into the working world. But I think doing it kind of how I've been doing it and, you know, separating my master's with this fellowship it's really helping me develop some those research skills that I know I want to kind of incorporate into my thesis once I go back for my second year of my master's. Um, you know, so it's helping me with research skills, with interviewing skills, um, just how to find information, I think, um, and also see the specialists in these fields. So, you know, when I kind of go back to my master's program, I can have an idea of who the main people are that are working on these types of issues or the types of other think tanks and organizations that are working on these issues. So there's so many things that I'm really looking forward to bringing back to my program when I go back to Massachusetts. You know, and ultimately my goal for my master's is to work on a thesis that's related to climate and migration concentrated in the Middle East. So I think the two research projects that I've been able to work on at the archive have also really given me a lot of valuable skills and how to think through these topics and think about you know, what specifically do I want to focus on in my thesis? So I think it's it's a great, you know, kind of opportunity to do in the middle like this for anyone else that's interested. That's great. And, uh, you know, we never know sort of where these fellowships can lead us. I feel like there's always new job opportunities, new mm -hmm. networks that we've developed. But uh, what do you think right now that you'll do after your master's? Do you have an idea? No, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I'm definitely thinking about it all the time, always trying to think about, you know, what my next move is or what, you know, the kinds of things that I'm interested in. I, again, I'm always looking out for fellowships. I'm constantly checking the ProFellow database to yeah. see what's there. <laughs> um, you know, I really am looking at a lot of journalism fellowships um, that I think would be really interesting, especially kind of as this segue from the National Security Archive work um, and with these FOIA skills that I've gained. I think that would really, you know, be a nice transition and then, you know, I'm also just thinking about pursuing a career in academia and, you know, going for that PhD. I really 
feel myself kind of gravitating gravitating towards these issues of climate and migration. And I think that could be re something really interesting to explore in a PhD setting, whether I ultimately, you know, go into academia or end up taking more of a policy role. I think a PhD would be really beneficial kind of in those areas and to be able to just, you know, be an expert and talk about something. So. Oh, that's excellent. Lots of potential pathways that you can move into. And <laughs> Since you mentioned it, yes, let me put in a plug for the free profello.com database because you mm -hmm. actually found a lot of your fellowships, uh, if not all of them, through the Profello Definitely. database. And even, um, you know, we also at Profello, we teach about how to find fully funded programs. They're mm -hmm. not necessarily that easy to find. A lot of it is speaking to admissions, figuring out who offers graduate assistantships. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another thing that we really try to teach at profellow.com is how to find these programs that offer funding. Mm -hmm. But yes, if you're not already in the database, everyone should sign up. It's a free database. We currently have more than 2000 fellowships um, and fully funded graduate programs included. And you can even in the fellowship realm, there's professional fellowships, summer fellowships, doctoral fellowships, master's fellowships and postdocs. So there's lots of different opportunities. Um, and the great thing is, is you can pursue, pursue fellowships all throughout your career. So uh, Rachel, she's looking for more fellowships post degree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's great. So Rachel, um, thank you so much for sharing your experience, your journey, kind of where you were a couple of years ago, where you are now. Do you have any uh, final thoughts or application tips that you mm -hmm. want to share with aspiring fellows and aspiring graduate students? Yeah, definitely. I would say, you know, the three biggest pieces of advice I can offer are start early, you know, you know, start if you're looking at fellowships, if you're looking at grad school applications, start as soon as you can, um, because that'll really, you know, give you the time to be able to put together a competitive application, especially, you know, if you're applying across disciplines, if you're applying to multiple different types of fellowships, it'll really kind of help you do the application justice to be able to take the time to hone in on those personal statements those research proposals and, you know, getting, you know, letters of affiliation if you need it. Um, and then the second piece of advice I would say is don't be shy about reaching out to people, whether it's, you know, admissions, whether it's faculty members, alumni of, you know, grad programs or fellowships, they will all kind of help give you a better window into what this program is going to be like and if it's a good fit. And they'll be able to kind of give you those tips um, to just you know make, make your application the best that it can be. So just you know any any advice that you can get from people that have already gone through it or people you know faculty members definitely don't be shy about reaching out to them because they're there to help. Um, and then the last thing that we've already kind of touched on is just be confident in yourself. Um, just know that you are a competitive applicant and that you're looking at these programs for a reason because they're of interest to, to you. And even if they seem like a reach or they seem really competitive, don't be shy about, you know, really going for it. And this course will really help give you the tools to be able to do that. Fantastic. Thank you, Rachel, so much. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, I'm really excited to see where you go in your career. And I'm sure we'll stay in touch for a very long time. So yeah, definitely. So much, Rachel. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me, Vicki. Mm -hmm.